Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. For this week's episode, I interviewed an entrepreneur who helped build several media ventures, some of which scaled to millions of dollars in annual revenue. Alexis Grant didn't start her career with the goal of building several media businesses. She simply wanted to work as a reporter. After college, she got a job at the Houston Chronicle and then later accepted a role editing the career section at U.S. News and World Report. But something about the business of media intrigued her, and while at U.S. News and World Report, she launched a side hustle running social media and blogs for corporate clients. Eventually, she drummed up enough business to quit her day job and focus on content marketing full time. In fact, she launched an entire marketing agency that specialized in producing branded content. One of her clients was a personal finance website called The Penny Hoarder, and she was so successful at growing its audience that the company eventually acquired her agency and installed her as editor-in-chief. By the time she left The Penny Hoarder a few years later, it was generating tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue. I recently interviewed Alexis about how she helped scale these companies and what she plans to do next. Before we jump into the interview, I have kind of a weird request. Every now and then, people have reached out to me to come onto their podcasts, and I've found that I really enjoy the experience. I'd love to appear on more podcasts in the future. So if you host a podcast and need someone to come on and talk about technology or media, I'm definitely game. Reach out to me at simonowens at gmail.com. That's simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, now on to my interview with Alexis. Hey, Alexis, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm having you on because you're this media entrepreneur who's been at the center of several really cool ventures. Uh, but you actually got your start in traditional journalism, right? That is true. Yeah. Yep. I went to J school after college and I started out at the Houston Chronicle and then moved to U.S. News and World Report. And like, what was the dream originally? Like, was it just to be kind of like a gumshoe type reporter? Did you want to be, do magazine journalism, like long form magazine journalism? Like, what did you kind of envision? No, I just love straight up reporting at the beginning. I loved like that I could ask questions. I had a permission slip to ask whatever I wanted. It was a good fit for my personality to be able to meet deadlines quickly. And yeah, I just loved the the reporting piece of it and the writing piece. And even at the beginning, I had I really didn't have any inkling even to become an editor. So that that didn't come for me till later. And what was your beat at the Houston Chronicle? I got into it. So I actually started in the Washington Bureau because they had an opening for a contract position. So I was able to slide in there since I had just graduated. And then they moved me into their um, Houston newsroom. Mm -hmm. This was in 2005. And so I covered City Hall for a while and then I moved on to the health beat. I kind of got like pigeonholed into politics a little because that's where I got my start, even though it was never something that I really was super excited about writing about. So you didn't grow up in Texas? No, I grew up in upstate New York, <laughs> uh-huh. no, but I got to live in Texas for three years. And Texas is a great place for reporting. There's so much happening there. Almost every national story has some tie to Texas. So it was a really, it was a really exciting place to start my career. Uh huh. And, uh, and then you eventually, went, how long did you work there? I was there for three or four years. Um, and then I took a bit of a break to travel around and do some of my own writing and then I got a job at U.S. News in Washington, D.C. And what was your job there? I was covering careers and job search. So that was that was a really interesting beat for me because I had started getting interested in alternative careers. And even in, in, in the interim between being at the Houston Chronicle and then going to U.S. News, I had started a side business. At the time, I was helping companies with some content and social media. So it's kind of getting interested in that world and being able to write at US News about the job market and how to find a job and different ways of going about your career that was really appealing to me. And this was after US News and World Report when it like kind of started moving away from its magazine roots and started getting into rankings and verticals and stuff like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I actually worked on the best careers rankings. Yeah. And then so you were working there for for a few years. And then uh, you said that you were running this side business. Uh, eventually, that became kind of like a full time business for you. What was your thinking in terms of leading up to, you know, working on that full time? Like, what, what was kind of your thought process of wanting to leave kind of traditional journalism? Yeah, I never really planned on leaving traditional journalism. I loved it. I considered myself a diehard, even though I was still early in my career. But I found 
running the side business that I really liked the idea of, I got really into business. I think, I think when I was younger, I, my dad always bugged me to take business classes and I always refused because I thought it sounded really boring. But when I had my side business, I realized that business is really as simple as finding creative ways to make money. And I actually really enjoyed that part of it. Um, and so I wanted to be able to do, I wanted to be able to experiment and try other things and, and learn kind of outside of that traditional box that I had been in for journalism. And so like for the side business, was it just that companies were like, we need someone to run our company blog. So can you be blogging for us on the side or something like that? Yeah, it was. Well, I started out in social media specifically. <clears throat> I was just running different channels that companies needed run. <laughs> um, it's small companies, basically. And I ended up pivoting into blog management. So after a couple of years, I started focusing more and more on running blogs for companies. So that meant creating all the content for for it, creating the strategy. Often it also included sending out uh, the email newsletter. Um, sometimes there was some social strategy involved as well. And often when there was, when it was like a really high volume blog, it meant organizing lots of different freelancers to write for it as well. So I ended up really pivoting to this blog management track. And then I, I stuck with that for a few years. And this was kind of like the early teens of uh, when we, you heard this like freight, this emerging trend of uh, content marketing, which wasn't invented then, but really kind of, you, you know, you saw the birth of these companies like HubSpot and stuff like that. Uh, you, you saw these terms like inbound marketing uh, coming up. And then suddenly a lot of these companies that before, like maybe their predecessors uh, would have been buying traditional advertising, traditional marketing, they realized that they could actually start creating their own content and bringing in their own audiences and then slowly converting those long-term audiences into actual customers, right? And that was kind of the thinking of, of uh, t hiring someone who, like you who had these journalism skills that could create kind of like engaging content that would, would basically create uh, pull users into kind of like a purchase funnel, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was content marketing and it, it was a way to use content to make more money for the company. And then so you you eventually leave US News World Report, I think it was like 2011 or 2012. Uh, you start this company called, was it Social Social Exes? Yeah, I still kind of hate that. <laughs> but I called it Social Exes initially when I was like 2008, when I was, it's a play on my name and social. Yeah, it's a social stuff. portmanteau. Yeah. yeah. And then I social mean, and analysis. Yeah. And then it kind of, yeah. I regret not changing it because I didn't like it. But <laughs> when you're deep, deep in the work, you know, and you have a lot of work going, there are things that you focus on what's going to get you the farthest, the fastest. And so that was like the least of my worries. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I I had already started the company when I and I was sort of slowly growing it when I was at on the side when I was at U.S. News. So when I left there, I just went full speed with that. And so, like, how is a how is the client arrangement traditionally structured? Like you would actually it wasn't just you, like you would build like a newsroom or something or a, a remote newsroom for each individual client, right? Yes. It really turned into a small agency, which is, you know, how a lot of freelancers get started and then they build something around them. So I ended up hiring, you typically I'd hire an editor for each of the blogs that we started managing. And then the editor would, I would teach them how to run everything that needed to happen for that particular blog. And sometimes an editor would have two blogs, depending on the size of a client. But we had a really large network of freelancers that we would call on depending on what type of expertise we needed for each client. So over time, I was just kind of growing this database of writers and who had different specialties. And whenever we picked up a new client, we'd go to that or we'd go to our broader networks and say, okay, who, who do we have who can freelance for this? So when a client hired us, not always, but typically we'd charge basically a one monthly fee and that would include everything. That would include um, all of the writing of the content and the editing of the content and whatever other add-ons that they wanted are in a marketing capacity. So we really took it on upon ourselves to organize like all the freelancers that were writing for the blog. So the client didn't really even have to worry about that. And were these uh, were these freelancers doing like original journalism? Was it more just kind of thought leadership? Was it more curation? Like how in depth of like content were they creating? It was a combination. We did a lot of, um, I mean, it was it was blog posts, but there was a lot of reporting involved. So 
I'm throughout my career, I'm always looking for writers who can both bring a journalistic perspective or a reporting perspective, and then also be able to write in a fun, informal, like conversational voice that a reader can relate to. So there were blog posts, but I mean, they were high, high quality. And I think that's why we were able to, that's why we did well, because clients saw that they got results from the posts and, and they were well done. And I'm guessing there would be some kind of initial engagement where you had to try to figure out what was the kind of right content to fit fit their marketing needs. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes we do a trial for a new client, especially if it was going to be a big contract where we'd do a few pieces even for free just to show them what it would look like and they could get a feel for how they, how, what kind of content they wanted and also whether they liked working with us. And then eventually though, you, you took on a client called the penny hoarder, right? Yes, exactly. Uh huh. And that was, uh, that was, I've written about it. You can Google Simon Owens, the penny hoarder and find some older articles that I've had. I've also had the former, uh, or maybe still current, uh, managing editor on the podcast. So I definitely, uh, uh, encourage people to go back and listen to that to get the full story for the penny hoarder. But basically it was this guy, uh, who just was like blogging about personal finance on the side and it kind of just started picking up steam and then he needed someone with an actual, you know, journalism background to come in and kind of professionalize it and kind of scale it beyond just like a one man in his blog. Right. Yeah, exactly. Kyle Taylor is the name of the CEO and the founder at the Penny Hoarder. And I believe he'd run the blog for about three years before he found me and he found my agency through Google, through Google search. And we did a, a free trial for him and it worked out. And so that was in early 2014. And pretty quickly over a period of six months, that blog became one of our biggest clients. We were doing a lot of content for it. And we had a lot of different writers and I had one full editor dedicated to that that property. And mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, but eventually it like got, it was scaling so large that you decided that you were going to actually do away with all your other clients and focus on the penny hoarder, like as its actual editor in chief, right? Yeah. So Kyle acquired my company. So he brought, he, it was actually, it's an acco hire, which means that he did it to bring me and my team and our processes in house at his company. So we let go of the rest of our clients because that wasn't of interest to him and myself and I think it was three or four or five. I can't remember the exact number of how many people from my team then went in-house at the Penny Hoarder. So I was a second employee there. And yeah, you're exactly right. He he hired me so that he could focus on the business side of the, of the business and kind of have me being running and scaling the content side. And also he's, he was really interested in the infrastructure we had as well, because since we'd run a lot of blogs, we had a lot of processes in place for how to create content efficiently and how to create good content efficiently. We also had this huge stable or database of freelancers. So we ended up hiring a few of those folks on full time at the, at the penny hoarder. And then we continued to work with a lot of them as freelancers. And was the appeal to you that this was like a new level of scale that you could, you could work at since like before, like obviously you could scale an agency a little bit, but it's all based on just adding new employees and billing more and more. It doesn't have the type of scale that like uh, a media company like the Penny Hoarder has. Is that kind of what you're thinking of of wanting to do that instead of just sticking with the agency side? Yeah, it's funny because I never had any intention of becoming an employee again. It didn't interest me, but I had, by the time Kyle bought my company, I had worked with him for a year and a half. So I know I really like. I knew I really liked him. As a person, I liked his philosophy. I, I liked what he was going to build. Um, and yeah, I, I thought this was an opportunity for me to um, build something. You know, the company was doing really well. So we had a lot of resources and we scaled really fast. So I had I got to learn a lot by going in-house there. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to rehash everything about the Penny Hoarder since I already did an episode uh, about it. But can you talk about what it was like at its height, like how, like how you approached fin- personal finance journalism, like what kind of output you were creating on the journalism side, and then also a little bit about the how the business side of it worked? Sure, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, let's let's talk about like what was the actual what was it what, what was it producing on the journalism side? Uh, yeah, like, well, on a regular basis. 
In terms of volume, you mean? I mean, uh, so like in terms of like what the what you guys were actually producing, like what were you guys covering? How big was your newsroom? Um, uh, like what what was kind of the beat of the penny hoarder when it was at its height? Sure, the beat is personal finance, so it's helping people make more of their money, or earn more money, or save more money. Um, anything that had to do th- with that that could have like a unique, really helpful angle for the audience. And the target demographic was really women from, you know, 25 to 40. I mean, the company reaches people in demographics beyond that. But that was like, if you had to nail down one, that was the core one. So a lot of moms, moms who are trying to earn money on the side or maybe staying home with their kids and trying to earn money. Um, so the unique angle was always like we wanted we wanted the journalism to be reliable and dependable dependable so the reporting is always something that people can trust but we did it with a fun voice so that was kind of what differentiated the company and still does to this day is that you can read it and you're going to understand it it's not it's not financy jargon you know you can get it and you know how to apply it to your own life so throw out some headlines to just give the listeners like an idea of like the type of article that you guys would write um it'd be like the best best credit cards with the best rates best way to become an uber driver three like quick freelance jobs you could do at home stuff like that right yeah um i mean i'm pausing just because i've been my brain hasn't been in that in like a year and also it it changes really fast like at a startup the types of things you might focus on initially like i can tell you the first article that one of the first articles we wrote for them even as a client it was about how to make the most of i think it was task rabbit so like if you're a task rabbit work person working at task rabbit how do you make the most money or how do you make it work the best for you like tips for being a task rabbit so things like that um it's a lot about the gig economy um but just being smarter with your money and i always loved your business model because you guys i know you had display advertising for a little bit of a time but i think you eventually abandoned it uh you guys focus mainly on what's called performance marketing uh can you talk a little bit about how that side of the the, the business worked yeah absolutely I, I love this stuff um we did almost no display which was really cool because it meant that it was a really clean experience for the user but performance marketing it's it's somewhat similar to affiliate marketing if people are familiar with that model. So in affiliate marketing, um, I might have a website and I recommend a product to somebody and if they buy it, I get a cut of what they paid to the producer of the product. Um, Performance marketing is kind of similar to that, but I think what differentiated the penny hoarder and what was really cool is that people didn't necessarily have to spend money for the penny hoarder to earn earn money. So I'll give you an example. at one point in time, I don't know if this is still the case, but at one point in time, we had Uber as a client and Uber wants to bring more drivers into their into their um, atmosphere. And they relied on the penny order to deliver those drivers. So we might write a post, we might interview Uber drivers and say, hey, what are your tips for um, making money? Like, are there any insider, is there any insider knowledge we can share with people who are thinking about doing this? Or how does it work for you? Give us an example of how you organize your day as an Uber driver. And we'd share that information with the readers. And then when someone signed up to be an Uber driver, the penny hoarder would get a payment for that. And it was kind of a win-win, like the penny hoarder get pay, gets paid, the company gets another driver, and the, the, the reader, the user has another way to earn or save money. Yeah. Or like, I'm guessing like maybe another uh, KPI that you would get paid based on is like if someone filled out a form or si- or gave over their email address or signed up for a credit card or something like that. So it wasn't just based on, you know, putting in an Amazon link and uh, only only getting paid if someone clicked on that link and then purchased that product. There were, you, you kind of vastly expanded the different kinds of actions that people could take for which you would get paid. Yes, absolutely. It's more lead driven and really in a way that serves the end user because we want them to come back again and again. And uh, and then what was also cool about you guys is like a lot of affiliate marketing, like there's an already, if, like if you're working with Amazon, there's already an affiliate program in place uh, and you kind of have to abide by whatever its terms are. Whereas you had a team that was actually reaching out and forming relationships with these clients and setting the rates and negotiations and what the KPIs were and how much you would get paid and everything like that. Uh, so that kind of vastly expanded 
uh, your potential client base. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have a, a company like that, that has is known amongst advertisers for delivering high quality audiences, people really want to work with the company. So it was, it, it always made sense to establish those relationships, those one-on-ones. And so I encourage my listeners to go back and listen to that episode to get like a really full in-depth look at the Penny Hoarder and, and how it works. Uh, uh, but so you eventually left the Penny Hoarder and, and moved back north, like you were living in the DC area before, and now you sort of live somewhat uh, in that area. Uh, what year was that? Yeah, I left the Penny Hoarder a year ago. So the, the Penny Hoarder is based in Florida, and we I had moved my family down there for two years. Um, and then a year ago, we moved yeah, outside of the D.C. area. We live in West Virginia now in Harper's Ferry. Yeah, and like it's a very kind of rural area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, so I want to dial back a little bit now. So we haven't been talking about this kind of elephant in the room of what was also happening concurrently is that you had also launched this site called The Right Life uh, several years before, and it was kind of running on the back burner uh, while you were working at the Penny Hoarder, what is the right life? I, you know, I thought you were going to say, Simon, because you said we haven't talked about what really happened during those four years. <laughs> I had two kids at the same time when I was doing my business. That's what really happened. In my brain, yeah. that was like the big thing happening. Um, but yeah, yeah, I also, so I started the right life in 2013. So that was kind of way before the Penny Hoarder. And we uh-huh. started it because we had this is when we were running blogs for other clients. And I realized that we had we had created all these different processes for running blogs and we had all these freelance writers. And I wanted to use those on an asset of our own and of my own that would grow over time. So really putting some of leveraging some of that good gold that we'd created and create something for myself that I could keep over time. So and, yep, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, keep on going. Well, I interrupted you. I was gonna say when I when I went to the penny hoarder those four years were really uh, um, rather sleep deprived and tiring for me because, you know, I was a leader at this fast growing startup, which was a love, like, I, I really loved it. It was a great growth experience for me. And at the same time, I also had two babies. And so I had to put the right life um, kind of on autopilot during those four years. I didn't, I I had an, an editor running the site. So I pretty much tried to scale it down and just have it at a point where she could run it without ever ask, needing to ask me for anything. And my goal was just to kind of get through that period and have it keep growing and and not lose any ground. So you have this site, it's geared towards writers, specifically freelance writers. Um, and uh, it was kind of almost like designed to be put on the back burner in the sense that it has a lot of evergreen content that ranks well in Google, right? That's how you built a lot of the audience. Yeah, it's very, the traffic is very SEO heavy. Um, I mean, I really built, the site has been such, it's almost like my place to experiment with stuff. It has a pretty big audience. We see we see about, I think it's like maybe 350,000 page views a month. And it was, it was even higher than that a while ago. Um, so it kind of depends on how much energy I'm putting into it at any given time. But it's been like a place for me to experiment with, um, anything that I find interesting. Like in the last nine months, I've done a lot of SEO there just for fun because it helps me learn and I enjoy it. We also moved email service providers. I got us into ConvertKit recently. And I thought that was that was like a fun, um, very in the weeds type work for me. And it's a way for me to stay grounded and, and try new tools that are out there. And even though it's very SEO driven, you focused a lot on how to capture emails, right? Yeah, we definitely do. We have... Um, a number of funnels basically that are the idea is since there's so much tra- search traffic that means that you're bringing a lot of people to the site for the first time so whenever we can capture those people and get them on our email list it's a good thing and you've got like tens of thousands of, e- of email addresses at this point we do yep yeah uh-huh and so is that becoming a bigger part of driving repeat visitors is, is through email a little bit i mean I th- i'd like to be the, it to be even a bigger part I had kind of neglected that in the last few years. And so I've been coming back to it in the last six months and I really culled the list a lot. So I think we have some rebuilding to do there, but there's a lot of potential for sure. And I think you've told me in the past that your most successful strategy for email list building was just ha- just building a pop-up form uh, that pops up at some point when they're scrolling through the article. Yep. We do, we do some of that. We also have 
a number of freebies. So like we have a free ebook, we have a free comma course, we have a, a bunch of different things like that that people can sign up for and get true value. And then hopefully they'll stay on our list afterward. And then you were doing, so how was the monetization? Because I think you said that you just wanted to, to like basically pay for itself and just break even, especially when you're at the penny hoarder. Was it through, I remember you did things like some kind of e- ebook bundle where you sold something like that. You you did some affiliate marketing. How did, how, what was your approach to, to uh, monetizing it? Yeah, we tried a few different things. At the beginning, we did we did a couple of years where we had a big a bundle sale where we bundled together a number of products from other creators and then sold them at a discount. And that that did really well for us. Um, we've also, we have one of our own ebooks on the site and we do do a lot of um, affiliate opportunities as well. Um, I'm still kind of, I actually think there's a lot of opportunity here, but I'm not sure that it's something that I personally want to, like I've thought a lot about how to monetize the site in the future. And I, I really spent a lot of time over the last year since leaving the penny order thinking about like, what do I want to do with this site? Do I want to work on it more? Like what can I learn from it still? And I'm actually thinking about selling it in the next six months or so, maybe 12 months uh-huh. um, because I kind of, well, the main reason is I want to give myself more bandwidth to start a new project and do something different. and. Also, I think there's a lot of opportunity to monetize with a flagship course or tool or some other product. And I'm just not really interested in creating that. I feel like- That's interesting. Okay. Because I remember, I think we talked like after you, soon after you left the penny order and you were talking about maybe sinking some more time into the right life. And I, I was under the impression that you wanted to make it more of a business and make a real go at it. But it sounds like you've kind of steered away from that. Well, I want to give myself a chance to do that. I wasn't ready to let go of it yet, but I think I've realized now that it's fun. Like, I, and I still learn from it every day. <laughs> um, but I think I'm ready for a new challenge now. And a lot of what I did with that site reminds me of who I was like eight years ago, and I'm in a different place now. Um, so yeah, I think I think I've I'm ready to. If if I let go of that, I can have more time to take on some new projects. Yeah, I, I can understand that feeling. Like as much as I like, as lo- as much as I find media fascinating, and I l- like running my newsletter and podcasts, I think there are times where I'm like, man, it'd be nice to expand my beat a little, or like learn about something new, not be so n- not right to such a narrow audience. Mm-hmm. So I could see, especially now that you've kind of uh, moved on to a different stage in career, that uh, you, like it it might not be as exciting to to run this thing that you've been running since 2013. Yeah, I always love the business side of it, but the actual topic, which is like freelancing and publishing, it's not really my jam anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I kind of, I, I can lean into the business pieces as much as I can, but then it'll be fun time for something else fun. So your husband, Ben, has actually been on this podcast as well. Uh, he's, he has this little media venture of his own. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I love talking about Ben <laughs> stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. He, yeah. he teaches online courses, online courses that help people learn to use Google Sheets. So it's a really cool niche. And it's been actually super fascinating to watch him grow this audience. And I am amazed by him every day because he has created such a loyal and high converting audience around this niche topic. Um, he started this, like he actually was, he was a forensic accountant before we got married. And then, um, in 2014, I think it was, he, maybe 2015, he left, um, that job to start a business and had to figure everything out from scratch. And it was really cool to watch him grow his following. And, and now it's like, it's really working. It's really taken off this year. He actually ran a conference called sheets con. So it's a conference about Google Sheets and it was it was an online conference for two days and it did tremendously well. And it was just really it was just really an exciting time to watch people come around together around this topic that they feel so passionate about. Yeah. And I love reading about media companies or media ventures that were it's kind of like right place, right time. Like uh, my um, 
my episode immediately prior to this one we're doing now was with this guy who like uh, went to go research like how to barbecue ribs in like 2005 and found almost no good information on the web on the on the internet and so he basically just created this site called amazingribs.com and now it's like this huge flourishing um, website that's like monetized very different ways and the same thing kind of happened with Ben is like he started getting into Google Sheets back when there was a, a ton of like content about how to do Excel, but not a lot of content about how to do Google, Google Sheets. And at the time, probably Google Sheets user base was still relatively small. But now that the business has matured a little bit, uh, a lot more businesses are using it over Excel. So he kind of got in right at that right time when people were starting uh, to, to research how to do Google Sheets. Yeah, that's exactly right. And his his search traffic does really well. That's one thing I like to help him with is I find it like a fun, a fun little project. And you can just see it's, it's going to it's it's about to blow up because it's going up, up and up. It's doing really well. And he initially used it as like a lead generator for consulting for whenever a business wanted to hire him to kind of set up their accounting or, or I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, but he eventually created like a more scalable passive income because uh, he created he used like Teachable or one of these online learning platforms and basically designed a somewhat expensive course that someone could take to basically learn kind of a one oh is it a one oh one or a two oh two type level course of how to use Google or set up Google Sheets on their own, right? Yeah, exactly. He teaches on Teachable and he has a variety of different levels of courses around sheets, including one that's on App Script. So what's really cool, I think, from some as someone who's watched um, who thinks a lot about online businesses and different um, different target markets is he's able to charge a high price for his courses. And when I'm saying high, it's like a few hundred dollars. It's not nearly yeah. in the range of like what some of the ones out there are. But, um, you know, it's different than for the right life, for example, writers, they don't they're not looking to spend a lot of money. Like I could put a $39 ebook on the site and that could do well, but he can sell a course for $3.99 because he's selling, he's helping people do this specialized skill. And they're also using that skill for work. So I think the fact that he was able to tie something he can teach to something that people can use to make more money or help their company make more money, it adds more value to his product. Uh, yeah. And I think the last time I had him on, he was generating somewhere around like $80,000 a year in passive income. But it sounds from what you're saying that the business is, has matured more since then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so from a family perspective, we decided part of the reason I left the penny hoarder last year was because we wanted to move to a place that had accessible trails and it was more in the woods. And we were able to do that partly because both of us could work remotely, but also because, um, you know, we we were we've kind of gone back and forth over the years in terms of whose income we relied on, and we were ready to kind of flip that switch and start relying on his income again as as the primary you know breadwinner. So it's been cool to to watch him watch that evolution. And how much does he turn to you for advice, given your background in media and building these types of companies? We talk a lot. <laughs> um, it's fun though. I mean, I it's funny because sometimes we always joke that we wish the other person wanted to be a stay at home parent because it's really hard, especially right now where it's a challenging yeah. time when you have two people who are trying to keep their careers up and a two and a four, four year old at home all the time. But I mean, we wouldn't be the same people if that was the case because we get to talk about so many cool um, business concepts. And we actually, until COVID hit, we had a, a weekly hike that we took together. We call it our, our weekly genius hike. So we just take a hike around here and talk about whatever we're working on with our business and um, different ideas and just run it through things with each other. We each also have our own individual business coach. We both work with different people for that, but it's really nice to have each other in, in a sort of, there are similarities to the space that we're in. Um, and there are also efficiencies too. Like we're starting now to combine things like we're moving all, we're moving all of our web properties to one server, for example. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really makes it really fun. So I know you've been thinking about like moving into a, some kind of non-media venture. Like what's your thinking there? Well, I really just want to experiment with some new, new things in the coming years um, and new ways to use my skills. Like I, I've been, I was until COVID hit, I was drawn to maybe starting some sort of in-person business 
just to give myself a new challenge and see if I enjoyed that. But I've actually been working on something else new that has really been exciting me that I'm probably going to go in a, this direction instead. And that's been um, working at a consulting capacity, helping media companies grow their content teams. So it's been cool because a lot of the skills that I learned at the Penny Hoarder, I figured maybe I wouldn't get to use them again because I don't envision myself being in-house again at a large company. It's not really like who I am. I like building things that are smaller, not smaller in revenue, but smaller in people number <laughs> um, and smaller in red tape. And so um, it's been cool to be able to take some of the things that I learned about scaling and, and hiring and come in as a consultant to some, some of these other companies that need that and actually be able to use those skills again. And that's, that's the part that I really loved. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, I've just been, I kind of was experimenting with that this year and it's turned into something I think I'm going to keep going on because I like it. How does this differ than what you were doing back with social access? So that was really running. I'm not creating any content right now. That was content creation. Um, right now I'm working more on, um, startup infrastructure. So for example, like this one client I have has hired me to scale their writing team. So that includes finding the right writers, which is great because it, it lets me, um, tap into my network. So it's a good way to leverage my network and vet these writers and make sure that the right people, um, figure out what jobs you even need, what, what could you um, accomplish if you had certain roles on the team and what should those jobs look like? And then once you get the right people in house, training them and creating processes around content creation so it can be better and more efficient. And it, it was interesting actually when I first started thinking through how to do this because people often ask me for recommendations for writers and editors. And I had someone say to me, how do you, how do you always find these great people? And I realized that, like thinking through it, that a lot of times when I hire someone, yes, obviously they're a great hire and they, they're, they're great to begin with. But I think where a lot of that magic comes in is through training. And so being able to layer some training on top and help them really grow and come into that potential is something I've always enjoyed doing. So I ended up working that into some of these contracts. Um, so it's 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 completely different than what I did before, even though it's also in content. So is it is the idea? It's more like a management consulting almost uh, arrangement where you go in, set up this infrastructure, get everybody trained, and it kind of running like a well oiled machine, and then you get to kind of step back and move on to the next thing. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Those are always the best consulting clients where you just get to come in and give your ideas and then walk away <laughs> the, than the ones yeah. where you have to keep on working on month after month. Yeah. It's fun because I like it because there's a lot of people parts involved, but like it's all the good people parts, right? It's making sure you're hiring great people. You're giving them the tools to succeed. Um, you're creating a cohesive team and it, yeah, it's all the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder like where, where the content business is going. Cause I felt like it kind of reached its peak, its peak, like a few years ago, like we're, you know, the height of like the, the hub spots inbound marketing conferences and everything like that. And everybody was like trying to become a media company, build a media company around their, whatever their business was. Uh, but my sense is from following that space is that there's somewhat of a law of diminishing returns where a lot of uh, a lot of companies invested in content and they just didn't see the kind of returns that they were hoping. Um, do you think that 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 really keeps on continuing to grow as like a sector of media is like this kind of content marketing brand journalism type of stuff that's like a cool hybrid between marketing and journalism? Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, I hope, I always hope that true journalism <laughs> it can exist and be profitable <laughs> for, for the company just in terms of being able to stay alive. But I do think as well that there's a place for um, content that's also truly helpful, <laughs> but maybe written in, in a bit more voicey so people can really be interested in it and it can also help convert, make conversions and make money for the company so they can keep hiring the people who make that content. Yeah. Okay, Alexis. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find your work online? I'm at alexisgrant.com. 
Awesome. Well, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.